Women Taking the Lead, Episode 202. Never underestimate the value of your authentic self. Allowing your authentic self to show up wherever you go provides a a certain level of consistency in your life. You don't have to change your mannerisms or do things to fit in or to avoid being ridiculed. That if you show up as your authentic self, people can value, respect that and appreciate that. Hello, my name is Jody Flynn and welcome to Women Taking the Lead, where we are all about creating blasts of inspiration to help you overcome self-doubt so you can lead with confidence, integrity, and a sense of humor. Have you grabbed your copy of my best-selling book, Accomplished, How to Go from Dreaming to Doing? Head over to womentakingthelead.com forward slash accomplished to access the secrets to achievement and success. Now, your future awaits. So let's get started. Your website tells a story about your business. At Zebra Love Web Solutions, Millie and her team are going to make sure your website tells the story you want your customers to hear. Connect with Millie at ZebraLoveWebSolutions.com to create the impression you want to make. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm here with Elizabeth Williams Riley, President and CEO for the American Conference on Diversity, and she brings more than two decades of experience in education, training, and consulting on diversity and inclusion matters, working with corporations, nonprofits, professional associations, communities, and schools, nationally and on the local level. She was recently named Girl Scouts of America Jersey Shore 2015 Woman of Distinction, the 2013 Woman Worth Watching, and is featured in Diversity Journal. Elizabeth is also a 2014 Lead New Jersey Fellow. She is a dynamic presenter, facilitator, and diversity and inclusion expert, and I'm going to go on to say a very gracious guest because our first recording the technology just was not with us that day, but I'm, you know, I have to say, Elizabeth, I'm so grateful because our first conversation was so amazing. I'm glad we get to do this again. Absolutely. So that's just a little intro for everyone. So if you could, Elizabeth, let us know a little bit more about you and your own humble beginnings. Well, I'm originally from the magical city of Orlando, Florida, where uh, Disney is the top employer and everybody goes to Florida for that reason. Um, I uh, grew up on the west side of Orlando, Florida and uh, attended public schools, had working parents and really uh, learned early on how to uh, think more broadly about life and to be open to new experiences and, and just began to understand how to be resourceful. And also to be confident in who you are and uh, to be boldly uh, and to boldly address things that are important in our society. So uh, as a young person, really being very thoughtful and almost having like an old soul in a sense, but really um, coming to terms with who I am and understanding uh, my place in the world and uh, being open to people and loving and, and loving people and being uh, maybe a little shy at first uh, when I was in the early ages in, in elementary school and, and middle school, but uh, always very talkative. So I've always been a person that loves to talk and engage in conversations. So they tell me. <laughs> yes. Well, we had such a great first conversation. I'm going to back that one up. And, you know, from from our conversation and what, you, what you've just shared with us, really getting a sense that it's no mistake that you're in the work that you're doing today. And, and I know you're going to get into more of like the journey that took you to where you are today. But you have just this open spirit about you. Um, and, and I'll concur. We, we chatted about that before too, about how you just you love, you're so curious and you love chatting with people and that really bridges some gaps, that curiosity you have. And, mm-hmm. you know, I'm just, I'm just going to lead you right in there, Elizabeth, because, you know, I, I, everyone should know Elizabeth is a very confident person, human like the rest of us, but man, she's, she's on a mission to change the world and that gives her some confidence. But Elizabeth, if you could start us off with, you know, the playing small moment, right? That, that human experience we all have where we, we just don't realize how capable we are and, and how, you know, 
big our soul is, I guess, to say in the world and what we can accomplish. And because of that, there are times in our lives when we, we, you know, hit the brakes a little bit, or we hold a little bit back. We just don't go for it. Mm -hmm. Um, but usually in, in like years later, we'll realize, oh my goodness, like I, I was, I could have, I could have done so much more. So if you could share with us the story of your playing small moment and the lessons you've learned from it. Well, I'll tell you what, my moment started very early in life. It was around the age of 15 or 16 years old. Um, I had to really come to terms with my people package. Uh, I had to understand being comfortable in the skin that I am, uh, the size that I am and, and, and who I am as an individual. And uh, at the age of 16, wanting to uh, just navigate through the world uh, in a way that was kind of reserved, but boldly in other places. So my mom uh, wanted me to compete in a pageant and it was a beauty pageant. And I'm thinking to myself, are you kidding me? I don't fit the mold for any of these things. I I mean, this is ridiculous. This is for those girls, not me. And I was very talented and, and did things at school. Um, and I did a lot in the community at church, but I just didn't feel that that was a place that I didn't belong. And, uh, my mom said to me, look, I'll see you after school. You're just as talented. You can compete. And there's no reason for you to, to, to feel like you don't belong or you can't do this. You can do it. I'll see you after school. And that was all it took. <laughs> and so I, I realized in that moment that I probably was selling myself short. I, I, I auditioned for the uh, pageant. I actually made it through to the finals and actually competed and won. So, I mean, that was an aha moment for me because what I realized is that I was in, I was getting in my own way and had it not been for, uh, that, you know, mandate by my mom to be more confident and know who you are, I wouldn't have known my own potential. I wouldn't have seen how I could rise in a moment and, and be all the things that I knew I was, but also be that to other people. And it, it didn't matter as much about what I thought, but it, it mattered more about, you know, how I was able to communicate, uh, tell a story about history, about legacy, and to be the person and have my spirit shine through. And that was something that I, I had to learn very early and later on being interviewed uh, by a um a television personality uh, to about my accomplishments. And he said to me, well, you know, you don't fit the mold. And I had already had that conversation with myself. So when he said it, I was ready. <laughs> yes. So I knew to say, you know what? When people begin to see who you are, they think less about what you look like and they appreciate more of who you are and what you do. And to me, that was, you know, my, my moment, uh, my defining moment in my life and everything since that moment, I, I, I really, uh, tried to make sure I didn't sell myself short, even, um, packing up and moving from Florida to New Jersey, where I had no family, no friends, I left everything that I knew to take on a new role and a new responsibility to broaden my horizons and work with people all over the country. And that to me was um, how I continue to uh, uh, take on that spirit of adventure, but also realizing that it, there was more to me than what you see and that I had that it factor and I was going to be able to achieve any of my goals I wanted to in life. And so it, it just meant so much to me to build that confidence and to move forward and actually achieve my goals. Mm, God bless your mom. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, and I'm constantly saying to people, when somebody compliments you, when somebody believes in you, when somebody points out something about you that you don't see, believe them because our brains are wired to look for the negative, not for the positive, not for the strengths. That takes practice. Mm -hmm. You know, it takes constantly paying attention to it. And you're right. If you had not had, if your mom hadn't made the mandate yes. <laughs> that you were going to be doing this, you wouldn't have had that opportunity to see that about yourself. And I can definitely relate to that. I'm having headshots, you know, and some pictures taken tomorrow and there's still, and I'm not 16 years old anymore, right? <laughs> I'm a full grown woman, you know, and there's still a part of me that's like, Oh, I don't love having my pictures taken. But regardless of whether it's in the area of, you know, your, your body image or your looks, it could be other areas of your life. Some people feel very confident in that area and they sell themselves short in others. Absolutely. And 
you know, we all have to kind of test the, not only the, the, the comfort zone, but the idea of where our limits are. We have to constantly be testing those mm-hmm. because let's face it. And for those of you listening to, you don't know what your limits are. You mm-hmm. have yet to know, and your limits are far beyond where you think they are. So yeah. Your limits are as far as you uh, create them to be. And so mm-hmm. when you live a life without limits, you open up the windows of opportunity. Uh, you open up doors to new opportunities. Uh, you can really reimagine uh, your entire career path. You can reimagine uh, the skills and talents that you have and how they can be applied to help you in your life. So when you don't spend time setting limitations for your life, you are often engaged in a process of opening up your world. And so for me, I think that is very important. And it's important for you to understand that because it's in that moment of just getting that window open and getting some of that fresh air and, and getting all the confusion and cloudiness out of your life that you can really focus on, on you and focus on achieving dreams. I think that is so important to do that. Yeah. Amen. And now Elizabeth, if you could, I want you to share another story. This one is of an aha moment or a realization. It could be, it can be instantaneous or a slow dawning, you know, mm-hmm. in either case, there's something that led up to it, that moment of action when you're ready to act on it. And then what's also important is the steps you took that led to your success because aha moments are great, but they're nothing if we don't act on them. So if you could share with us the story of your aha moment. Well, I'll tell you, it's it's, it's really amazing to think about uh, when you have uh, different opportunities. So I'll talk about just the moving and relocating to a different space and, and leaving everything that you know and love and have established in your life. And, and that to me was uh, one of the most challenging things I think I've ever done in my life. And I had to realize that if I took the first step, then everything else could be aligned for me. And that if I took the first step and, and, and was courageous in doing that, that I could uh, then learn from others. I would be able to create my own new kind of support network. I could uh, begin to explore more dynamics of difference and understand how cultural differences, not just in terms of race and gender, but looking at where people come from and having a chance to engage with people who are so different and who had such different life experiences than my own that I could grow. And so it was, it was that, um, opportunity to see both sides of the coin. So although I was thinking I was taking this bold step that was going to be all about me and, and being able to enhance my life, I learned very quickly that whatever I had and the confidence that I had in myself, if I showed that to the world, I can inspire and encourage others. And Mm -hmm. to me, um, that exchange in life and that opportunity to, Take one step at a time. Okay, you you make the move. You you get to a place. You make you make a decision to be better. Um, when you gauge in work of fighting bias, bigotry, and racism, and you tackle a tough job, and you it can make you bitter or you can make you better. And so I had to make a decision to be better. And in all that I do in the challenges of helping people understand some of the uh, struggles that others go through in their own social identities, it helped me to realize that the more I focused on appreciation, the more I thought about valuing people and all that they offer to the table, their, their greatness, their flaws and everything, the more I was able to grow and also share and inspire others. So that was really a, a big part of it is taking the first step and then making sure that you're aligning your life and your commitment to achieving what you want to in, in, in your life. But also remember that what you do influences people around you. Mm-hmm. Elizabeth, that was a great flyby and uh, an educational moment for everyone else. But what I want is a story. <laughs> what, where were you? Who were the characters involved? What was the, the, the realization you had? And then the specific steps that you took that helped you to get to the next level or the next place you needed to be. Well, when you talk about a story, I, I guess for me, it, it I, I, I'm like drawing a blank here. Um, I think that I have a lot of stories. Um, one is just around 
uh, I remember being um, asked to um, take on a certain initiative. I was in Orlando, Florida. I had opportunity to work with a school district that was turning 100 years old. And I was in charge of creating a wall of history and pictures of who was around and what happened. And I realized very quickly there were no pictures of people like me. I had to um, take on the responsibility of making sure a story was told about people that looked like me, people who lived in my community. And I had to go out into the community and build relationships. So I had to take on this opportunity to go into neighborhoods, go to people's doors, knock on their doors, collect photographs, sit down and hear their stories and talk to them and really bring that back to the public. And so after doing that, I had to then convince other people that this was important. And and in doing that, I had to make sure that I told the story succinctly. I had to. I had a boss that was um, very nice to me um, and wanted to encourage young people to do well. And she um, liked the work that I was doing and gave me free will to kind of pick and choose what I like to do. Um, and she allowed me to tell a story on my own with little supervision. And when I was able to tell that story, I began to connect more people to the community. So for me, I have little things that are very important to me. And that was one that said, you must go out. You have to be a truth seeker. You have to be able to communicate with people. You have to learn how to pull the stories from people. And I remember sitting in the living room of one of, um, a lady who graduated from the only African-American school in the state. And she told me about um, how difficult it was to be um, in a place that didn't respect who she was or didn't value her as an individual. And we talked and it made me understand how important my life and my mission was. So from that, that point on, I really made it a priority to respect and value everyone that I came in contact with and, and to really appreciate who they were um, for just being, you know, uh, the creating and believing in the humanity of individuals. That was a big part of that. And so that that's another example of how I had to really uh, do multiple things. I had to investigate. I had to go out to the community, do research, but I also had to be able to tell stories and get people to talk to me and communicate. And I think that's a part of being a strong leader. And it's also a part of being able to uh, lift up that which is worthy of, of recognition. I love that story, Elizabeth, because I think that's where a lot of the the entrepreneurial spirit or the spirit of change comes from is you see something is missing in the world mm -hmm. and you and you you come your mindset is this cannot go on so you were in a place where all the pictures up on the wall were of people who didn't look like you and that experience can make you feel like you're not valued you're not appreciated you're not seen or acknowledged and how interesting is that when you went out into the community you were finding other people who were saying the same thing and, I'm not appreciated right okay. and, yeah. and there were yeah. absolutely you know one of the biggest parts of, of, of understanding that when you have voids when there are voids people will fill them with whatever they think belongs there but when you have an opportunity to fill voids with the truth and fill them with people's uh, journeys and their real life stories, it makes a difference. And in one of the things I remember talking to someone and a colleague of mine, he's like, well, you know, one of the things that you've learned to do in all of your journey and, and your ability to talk to so many people, you, you have a lot of tactfulness. He said, you can tell somebody to, to uh, pack their bags and go to hell, but they'll look forward to the trip. So it also requires you to have um, some understanding of where meeting people where they are and you want to be a person that operates with purity of motive. And so purity of motive means that you, you don't allow stereotypes and your own person's bias and filters to get in the way of really um, appreciating and valuing who's in front of you. And also understanding how people get to the places that they are and being respectful of people's journeys because we don't all come to the table with the same advantages or we don't all come to the table with the same uh, family dynamics, uh, faith backgrounds, or even understanding of what it means to respect another person. Absolutely. Well, this is a great segue because one thing I'm, you know, I'm 
I stick to all the time and say constantly is there's no one way to lead. We oftentimes can get stuck because we have someone that we admire. We see them be successful and we think that's the way we have to be in order to be successful, not really considering does my personality style match that person's? Do we have the same strengths, you know, same backgrounds and experience? And because of that, we're all different. We're all going to lead a little bit differently. So Elizabeth, how would you describe your leadership style? You started to get in there a little bit, um, so I don't want you to have to repeat yourself, but what kind of has you stand out as a leader? I think one of the things is to be very humble. Um, and, and I understand that in order to be a great leader, you have to be a good follower. And I really appreciate the fact of uh, being under great leadership and understanding what it takes to be a leader. And so I'm humbled by that experience. I'm also very thoughtful in terms of how I I uh, engage with individuals. I, I really appreciate the uh, and having direct conversations with individual, but I'm also flexible to um, meet people where they are and also to understand people's um, journey in life. I think that I'm also a person that is a direct leader, but I do it with respect. So you can be direct and be respectful at the same time. And I think that's important for me. And I also am in tune with my own um levels of vulnerability. Uh, when you understand what things make you vulnerable and you work at achieving higher levels in life and working on your goals, it also empowers you in a certain sense. Because if I know my, my, my weakest moment, I also can find my greatest strength and I can transform my weakness into strength when I am in tune with it and I can name it and acknowledge it for myself. And I think it, I think for me, that's been a significant part of my leadership. I'm passionate. I am driven by um, what I do and the work that I do, but I'm also driven by the relationships and people that I have in my life. So you, no matter who you are, you're leading somewhere. Even if you're leading a cousin or an uncle or, or, or uh, someone in your neighborhood, we all have that potential to be leaders. It's just a matter of how do you make it work for you? And for me, it's that humbleness. It's the ability to accept people. And it's, and it's also being able to be clear about um, things that are important to me or what I value and what I respect. Nice. And Elizabeth, what is one thing you're working on right now that you're really excited about and want to share with us? I'm working on a, a statewide campaign called No Hate Campaign, and it was launched in January with a town hall meeting to talk about what it means um, and what hate means and what it, how it manifests itself in our society. And it's a really wonderful opportunity to create uh, bold and courageous spaces for people to engage in dialogue and to learn from one another and to really understand the role and the charge that we have to think about and respect everyone. Um, when we talk about what's going on in the climate in our society, we have to realize our intersectionality and that when we want to learn and grow, we have to make sure that we are thinking about all of us and not just some of us. And to me, this campaign speaks to that. It speaks to the call for us to love more, to um, confront issues of hate when we see it and learn how to be upstanders and not bystanders and to be more respectful of of the contributions that individuals make from all walks of life, um, from all different social identities, from all different cultures. And to me, this is, is a, it's a huge uh, campaign that I think uh, will transform the hearts and minds of others when people are engaged. So we're, we're looking at people to come in from all different um, sectors, all different faiths, all different religions, and all different cultures, but to create a space where we can have candid conversations, to be honest, and to learn and grow together. That's really exciting for me. That is awesome. I I, I can't wait to hear how, how it's all going and how it unfolds because it's it's not an easy topic to be discussing, but it's work worth doing. Absolutely. I, I really enjoy um, doing this work and it is um, rewarding, uh, but it, it has its challenges. And no, uh, you know, Frederick Douglass said without um, there's no progress without struggle. So you have to have some struggle. But I think for the most part, people are genuinely interested in connecting with one another as human beings. We all want to uh, be valued, be loved, respected, and feel like we belong. 
Of mm-hmm. course, I, I belong everywhere I go, but. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a great mindset, right? Yeah, it is. It, it's, 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 it's very important for people to uh, feel and understand that they belong. And wherever yeah. your, your, your feet take you or your mind creates for you, um, there has to have, you have to have a sense of belonging. Absolutely. And, and exactly. It's a mindset. You know, you don't have to have an invitation to belong. It's just, it's an attitude of, mm-hmm. I showed up here, I belong. <laughs> so Absolutely. I love that. And you, you named the word struggle, Elizabeth. So I am curious about what for you in your life is the biggest leadership or business challenge that you're currently faced with? Well, for me, um, working in the nonprofit sector is 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 very challenging because of the uh, fundraising and the things that you have to do. And to me, that is the greatest struggle of of being in a nonprofit sector. And that is, you know, having uh, to raise dollars to sustain the organization. And that is 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 a big challenge. But in that challenge is great opportunity to meet individuals, to connect with people who care about and want to do things, but also getting people to understand how to invest. And doing work like social justice work and and talking about fighting bias, bigotry and racism, it's not the same as going out telling people that you're going to do research to fight a disease. But in the same venue, in the same light, you know, when you talk about fighting bias, bigotry and racism, it is something that really can destroy our society if it's not taken care of. If it's not, if we're not giving people better ways to think about one another and, and we're not implementing the right policies and practices so that people can feel valued and respected. So it's a different type of work and people approach it differently, but it is just as important as any other type of work. And I think sometimes communicating that and getting people to understand that can be challenging, but People um, who are like-minded and who believe this, people often talk about preaching to the choir. And I say to them, look, I don't know if there is a choir. And even choirs have to have rehearsals. No performance. (laughs) (laughs) No choir goes out and perform without rehearsals. And people have to know their notes. And they have to understand when to come in, when to go out, all those things. It takes coordination. And so when you're working and doing this type of work, you it takes coordination. It takes people investing their time and resources and talents into doing this. And, it, and it's making sure that people understand that in ways that um, allow them not just to uh, show up, but to be engaged fully. And that's giving their time, talent, and often resources to do that. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. You know, it's easy for us to say, I already know this or I already understand this. But the real key is, are you living it? Because if you really know it and you really understand it, you would live it. So if you're not living it, you don't really know it. Mm -hmm. You don't really understand it. Absolutely. Awesome. All right, Elizabeth, now we're going into the quick leadership roundup. So tell us, what is one practice you have that helps to make you a better leader? Active listening. I think that, you know, active listening is so important and it's, it's, it's a process of being able to uh, hear what people are saying without thinking about your rebuttal. Like you're not listening for the point of response. You're listening to seek understanding. And for me, that has been one of the strongest um, skill sets and things that I've had to practice because it allows me to tap into uh, and understand where people are coming from when they have uh, experiences that are different from my own or when I'm challenging or confronting um, stereotypes and bigotry. So active listening to me is so important. Mm -hmm. And this was something we had in our our last conversation. I don't normally follow up at this point, but I think, you know, I don't want to let this moment go by because um, in the recording that we lost, (laughs) we chatted about how, you know, oftentimes what can bridge the gap of misunderstanding, especially when somebody doesn't understand where you're coming from or where I'm coming from, is that if we actively listen to the other person to understand them, Mm -hmm. what happens is their defenses come down, right? Absolutely. And then they're better able to hear what you have to say and understand where you are coming from. But it starts with you. Like, uh, I want to say, and for those of you listening, it starts with you mm-hmm. listening to understand the other person mm-hmm. that causes the shift Absolutely. to come back to you. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's an individual and collective responsibility and communication is a process. It's two sided. It's not just about one person um, uh, just talking and so forth. It's also about listening and, and how you take in and really, 
really absorb what people are saying to you and not, you know, using your own life experiences to uh, block your ability to listen. And I've often had to go into a room and, and, you know, showing up being the only woman or the only female or, or the only one of whatever that looks like and say, you know, I hope that in this conversation we can be able to understand one another and that um, you can you won't be able uh, to set boundaries or limitations to what we say. And, and basically saying, I hope that um, you don't get into a situation where you can't hear me because you see me. Mm. And I think that's important because oftentimes when we are exposed to negative experiences and someone else comes up and they sort of resemble or have any slight uh, uh you know, me, demeanor as the person that you encountered before, we can already begin to set up barriers and, and limit what we can do in terms of communication. So it's very important not to allow that to happen. Um, and active listening kind of breaks down that barrier. And Elizabeth, what advice would you give your younger self? I would always say never underestimate the value of your authentic self. Um, allowing your authentic self to show up wherever you go it provides a, a certain level of consistency in your life. You don't have to change your mannerisms or do things to fit in or to avoid being ridiculed. That if you show up as your authentic self, people can value, respect that and appreciate that. And share with us a success quote or a mantra and why it has meaning for you. One of my favorite uh, quotes is you never know how much your past will affect your future until it shows up in your present. And that's important for me because I just believe that there is such a connectedness to our history and who we evolve and become that when we are operating in our present, it allows us to project out those things that are found are foundational elements that have built who we are, that help us to understand, value, and respect our own life. And then it also ultimately shapes what you will do in the future and the legacy that you live um, leave behind. I think that legacy building is so important. And when you build a legacy on a solid foundation and you work at it, when you know in the moment, everything that you do matters and everything that you do counts is so important. And lastly, Elizabeth, what is the best way for this community to connect with you? You can visit our website at uh, www dot American Conference on Diversity dot org and get more information about the organization. And on that, you can reach out to me directly. Um, you can also call our offices at 732-745-9330. Awesome. And for those of you listening, you know, you can find all the links and resources that Elizabeth shared in this episode at women taking the lead dot com. And Elizabeth, thank you twice <laughs> <laughs> so much for taking the time to inspire and enlighten us, we are all better for having met you. Thank you, Jody. Thank you so much. All right, ladies, I'm going to talk straight because I know you ambitious, high-achieving, entrepreneurial women appreciate that. I know some of you are struggling and you find yourself saying, I know what to do to achieve my goal. I'm just not doing it. And you're struggling with having the time, energy, or willpower to move forward in your business or career. You may even be thinking you've developed adult ADD. I can help you with that, and you'll soon be surprised by how much you are able to get accomplished. No more going it alone, suffering silently while another year goes by. Send me an email at Jodi, J-O-D-I, at womentakingthelead.com, and let's get the conversation started. Thank you all for joining me on Women Taking the Lead. And to strengthen you on your own leadership journey, I'd like to send you off with a quote from Marianne Williamson, so here goes. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. 
And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Again, thank you for joining me, and here's to your success.